Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to talk about Ehrenfest's theorem in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The general idea we'll explore today is the time evolution of the expectation value of operators. Ehrenfest's theorem is simply a special case of this general situation where the operators are the position of a particle or the momentum of a particle. What we'll find is that the time evolution of the expectation values of position and momentum is described by a set of equations that resemble those obeyed by a classical particle. As such, Ehrenfest's theorem allows us to make a direct connection between the classical and the quantum worlds. Let's go! Our starting point are expectation values. The necessary ingredients are the state of the system psi, and some observable a. The expectation value of a in state psi is then written like this, and is equal to the bra psi, the operator a, and the ket psi. If we're only calculating the expectation value of the same state psi, and there's no possible confusion, then we'll omit this subscript here, and we'll simply write the expectation value of a in state psi like this. Now the expectation value is a number that describes the average of the probability distribution of state psi when written in the basis spanned by the eigenstates of operator A. For a full refresh about expectation values, I encourage you to check out the corresponding video linked in the description. And what we want to do today is to consider the time dependence of expectation values. To do so, we write the state psi again, which in general depends on time t as given by the Schrodinger equation. The observable a may also in general depend on time. Now many familiar observables like position, momentum or angular momentum do not depend on time, but we can sometimes encounter observables that do depend on time, and an example would be a Hamiltonian with a time-dependent external potential, say a varying external electric field. If we now calculate the expectation value of a in state psi, then it will also depend on time, and is given by the usual expression. Just to be absolutely clear, the expectation value is a scalar, and what this is showing is that its value is a function of time. The time evolution comes from both the bra and the ket, whose time dependence is in turn determined by the Schrodinger equation, and if the operator also depends on time, then it will also contribute to the time dependence of the expectation value. We now want to consider the time evolution of the expectation value, so we start by calculating its time derivative. We can explicitly write the expression for the expectation value in terms of the state psi and the observable a, and we can now apply the chain rule to get three terms. The first involves the derivative of the bra, the second involves the derivative of the ket, and the third involves the derivative of the observable. At a side point before we move on, note I have omitted the dependence of the operator a on time so that the expressions could actually fit in the line. To make progress, we now write the Schrodinger equation, which tells us about the time evolution of the ket, and we're also going to need the Schrodinger equation in the dual space to obtain the time derivative of the bra. Remember that in going to the dual space, kets become bras here and here, Scalars become their complex conjugates, hence the minus sign here, and in principle operators become their adjoints, but the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, so we can write it here directly without the adjoint. We're now ready to complete the calculation of the time derivative of the expectation value. We first take this expression for the time derivative of the bra and insert it here. Doing so we get this first term. We can also take this expression for the time derivative of the ket, and insert it here, and doing so we get this second term. And we finally have the third term, which doesn't change. The first two terms only differ by this minus sign here, and by the fact that the product of the Hamiltonian with the operator a appears in the order h a here, and in the opposite order a h here. This means that we can combine the first two terms to this expression involving the commutator of a with h. And we still have the same final term. Both terms now look like expectation values, so we can write the time derivative of the expectation value of a as equal to 1 over ih bar, 
times the expectation value of the commutator of a with h, plus the expectation value of the time derivative of a. This expression is one of the key results of today's video. It is a general result that applies to any observable a. However, today we'll focus on the special case when the operator a is either the position or the momentum operator. In this special case, the resulting equations are called Ehrenfest's theorem. But the general expression appears in many other quantum problems, and for another example, you can check out the video on constants of motion linked in the description. For Ehrenfest's theorem, we'll want to use this expression for the position and the momentum operators. The first thing to note is that position and momentum are both time-independent observables. This means that the second term here will vanish, and we only need to consider the first term, which critically includes the commutator with the Hamiltonian. This means that we need to decide on what the Hamiltonian of the system is. For simplicity, we'll consider a particle moving in a scalar potential, so that we can write the Hamiltonian as the sum of the kinetic energy plus a general scalar potential. Let's start with position. Using the formula for the time dependence of the expectation value, we get 1 over ih bar times the expectation value of the commutator. Now, before we move on, I should clarify that I'm abusing notation somewhat in this expression. The position operator R is really made up of three separate operators, x, y, and z. This means that this expression really corresponds to three separate equations, one for each component. For example, the equation for the position operator in the x direction looks like this. And we have analogous equations for the y and z components. This compact form up here using the operator R is very convenient, but whenever I use it in the rest of the video, you need to remember that it is simply a shorthand. Moving on, we first get the prefactor, and now we separate the Hamiltonian into its kinetic energy part and its potential energy part. The next step is to realize that this commutator vanishes because R commutes with any function of position. You can find the full proof of this result in the video on functions of operators linked in the description, but in short it is a consequence of the fact that any function of R is simply given by a power series in R, and R commutes with any power of itself. This means that the only commutator we have to evaluate is the first one here, involving the kinetic energy. To see what it is, let's consider the commutator between x and p squared. You can expand p squared in terms of its components. x commutes with py and pz, so we can remove these two terms. And we end up with this commutator. At this point we need to remember the general formula for the commutator of an operator A with the product BC of another two operators. This can be spelled out as this first term, plus this second term. If you don't remember this relation, you can find the proof in our video on commutator algebra. But moving on, we can then use this relation for our commutator up here, to get this first term, and this second term. This here is the canonical commutation relation, and so is this. So we end up with two ih bar px. Doing the same for the commutators of y and z, we would find analogous expressions, so using the compact vector notation we can conclude that the commutator of R with the kinetic energy term is equal to ih bar over m times p. Going back to the time derivative of the expectation value of the position operator, we find that it's equal to 1 over m times the expectation value of the momentum operator. And this is it. This is the Ehrenfest equation for position. Now, looking at it, it looks suspiciously familiar. But let's keep going for now, and we'll come back to this later. Let's now turn to momentum. The derivation is very similar to the one for position, so I won't go into as much detail as we did for position. Using the formula for the time dependent of the expectation value, we get 1 over ih bar times the expectation value of the commutator. Again, this is just a shorthand for three separate equations, one for each of the components of the momentum operator. We can again expand the Hamiltonian to get the expectation value of these two terms. 
and the momentum operator commutes with any power of itself, so this commutator vanishes. This means that the only commutator we have to evaluate is the second one here, and to do so we need to remember result from the video on functions of operators. The commutator between the momentum operator and any function f of the position operator is equal to minus ih bar times the derivative of the function f. We're just going to use this, and if you cannot remember this property right now, you can find the link to the video on functions of operators in the description. The same is true for the other momentum and position components, so in our case this means that the commutator between p and the potential v is equal to minus ih bar times the gradient of the potential. Going back to the time derivative of the expectation value of the momentum operator, we find that it's equal to minus the expectation value of the gradient of the potential. And this is it. This is the Ehrenfest equation for the momentum. Again, it probably looks pretty familiar, but before we discuss why, let's summarize the theorem. Ehrenfest's theorem says that the time derivative of the expectation value of position is equal to 1 over m times the expectation value of momentum, and that the time derivative of the expectation value of momentum is equal to minus the expectation value of the gradient of the potential. We can actually combine these two equations into a single expression. We can write m times the second time derivative of the expectation value of the position operator. The next step is to separate the time derivative. And using the first Ehrenfest equation, we can insert it here, and we get this. We can cancel the mass terms here and here, and what's left is simply the time derivative of the expectation value of the momentum, which is just the left-hand side of the second Ehrenfest equation, so we can write this whole expression as minus the expectation value of the gradient of the potential. This means that we can rewrite the theorem like this. And we're now ready to discuss why the equations in Ehrenfest's theorem look so familiar. The theorem provides a connection between classical and quantum mechanics. To see this we can consider Newton's second law. It says that the mass times the acceleration is equal to the total force acting on the system. If this force arises from a scalar potential, then it can be written as the negative of the gradient of the potential. And this equation now has the same form as this equation up here. I don't know about you, but I find this analogy pretty exciting. It suggests that we may be able to exploit Ehrenfest's theorem to make a connection between quantum and classical particles. The logical next question becomes, how do we make that connection? Can we really use Newtonian mechanics to describe the motion of quantum particles? To explore this question, let's describe the state of our system in the position representation. This essentially means describing the system in terms of wave functions, so let's consider a wave function psi of r and t. To make the discussion concrete, we're going to assume that the wave function describes a wave packet. Pictorially, I can draw a single spatial axis, say the x-axis, and then the wave packet at a particular time t0 will be something like this described by the wave function at time t0. At a later time t, the wave packet may have moved, say to this new position, with the corresponding wave function. This should look familiar, but for a full refresh on wave packets you can check out the corresponding video linked in the description. In this context, the expectation value of the position operator describes the center of the wave packet. At time t0, it is at this position, and at time t, it is at this position. This means that the expectation value is a point in space, and this point traces a trajectory as a function of time. Now the true wave function cannot be described by a single point, it has an extension that can be characterized by the root mean square deviation delta x. For the initial wave packet it should be something like this, and for the second something like this. And we know that this extended nature of the wave function is essential to fully describe a quantum particle. However, Ehrenfest's theorem says that the mass times the second derivative of the expectation value of the position operator is equal to the negative of the expectation value of the gradient. 
and we've already discussed that this equation has a very similar form to Newton's second law of motion. This expectation value here is simply the center of the wave packet here or here. So at this point we may be tempted to ask, does the center of the wave packet obey the laws of classical mechanics? The answer is not quite. In the quantum case, we can use Ehrenfest theorem to write an equation relating the change in the center of the wave packet to the expectation value of the gradient of the potential. In the classical case, we can write Newton's second law, but we can also rewrite the force as proportional to the gradient of a potential. If we now replace the position of the classical particle with the position of the center of mass of the wave packet, then the center of mass will behave like a classical particle if the gradient of the classical potential is evaluated at the position of the center of the wave packet. This means that the center of the wave packet of the quantum particle will move like a classical particle if the expectation value of the gradient of the potential is equal to the gradient of the potential evaluated at the expectation value of the position. If this equality holds, then the center of the wave packet will move like a classical point particle. If this equality doesn't hold, then the center of the wave packet, despite behaving like a point particle, will not obey the laws of classical physics. So now the question becomes, does this equality hold? The answer is not straightforward. Let's consider just one dimension for simplicity, but the discussion can be trivially generalized to three dimensions. The potential energy is a function of position, and when working with operators, we describe functions through their power series, so we'll need to consider the power series of the potential V. The key quantity that features in the Ehrenfest equations is the gradient of the potential, which in one dimension is simply the derivative of the potential, which in turn is given by this power series. We can now use this power series to spell out this equation up here. Starting with the left-hand side, we have the expectation value of the gradient, which is equal to the sum of the expectation values of the various powers. By contrast, for the right-hand side, we have the gradient of the potential evaluated at the expectation value of the position, which is equal to the sum of the powers of the expectation values. These two expressions will be equal if the expectation value of the powers is equal to the corresponding powers of the expectation values. But is this equality true? We actually have two possibilities. For n smaller than or equal to 2, then this equality holds. It is very easy to check this result. As an example, we can consider the case n equals 2, which gives this. By contrast, when n is larger than 2, then the equality does not hold in general. Again, you can check this result easily, and as an example, we can consider the case n equals 3, which gives this. This means that in general, the expectation value of the gradient of the potential is not equal to the gradient of the potential evaluated at the expectation value of the position operator. And in turn, this means that the point particle associated with the center of the wave packet does not follow the rules of classical mechanics. Now this result will come as somewhat disappointing because we were hoping to make a connection between classical and quantum mechanics. However, there is still some hope. We saw that if n is smaller than or equal to 2, then the expectation value of x to the power n minus 1 is equal to the corresponding power of the expectation value. This means that the center of the wave packet does behave as a classical particle if the potential can be written with powers up to second order. Now this subset of potentials actually includes a number of very important situations. For n equals 0, the potential is constant, and we have a free particle. For n equals 1, the potential is linear, and we have a particle moving in a uniform force field that could, for example, be an external electric field. And for n equals 2, the potential is quadratic, and we have a harmonic oscillator. In all these cases, the center of the wave packet does move like a classical point particle.
and in fact there is more. We can consider what's called the quasi-classical regime. By that we mean a situation in which the difference between this term and this term becomes negligible, so that we can actually approximate the motion of the center of the wave packet with the motion of a classical particle. This quasi-classical regime occurs when the wave packet is sufficiently localized compared to other relevant length scales. To see this pictorially, let's consider the x-axis again, and let's imagine that the wave packet at time t is rather narrow. We have its center here, and its width here. Mathematically, and in the full 3D version, we have a wave packet that only takes sizable values within delta r, and pretty much vanishes outside of this region. Now, I've drawn the wave packet to be very narrow, but what really matters is that it's narrow compared to the other relevant length scales of the problem. In particular, the quasi-classical regime describes a situation when changes in the potential v occur over length scales much larger than those of the wave packet width, so that the potential changes very slowly over the length scale of this diagram. In this case, we can approximate the gradient of the potential in this region by its value at the center of the region. So this is the quasi-classical regime. The wave packet is very narrow compared to the length scale over which the potential changes. Working in this regime, we can now evaluate the expectation value of the gradient of the potential, and explicitly writing out the expectation value in the position representation, we get this. We can now use the fact that the potential changes very slowly across the wave packet, as encoded by this expression, to approximate this gradient by its value at the center of the wave packet. This means that this term now is a constant, so we can take it out of the integral, and we end up with this term, times the remaining terms in the integral. The integral is just a normalization condition for the wave function, so we finally get the gradient evaluated at the center of the wave packet. And this is it. In the quasi-classical regime, the expectation value of the gradient of the potential here is approximately equal to the gradient of the potential at the center of the wave packet here. And this means that in the quasi-classical regime, the center of the wave packet behaves pretty much like a classical particle. Now, this sounds great, because we've managed to make some sort of connection between the classical and the quantum behavior of particles. The question you'll probably have now is whether this quasi-classical regime is at all relevant. After all, these conditions up here may appear somewhat stringent. Well, it turns out that these conditions are met by most macroscopic objects, so the quasi-classical regime is very relevant. To very roughly estimate this, we can take the de Broglie wavelength of a macroscopic object as giving the size of the wave packet, and for a macroscopic object this is tiny, much smaller than the distance over which potentials vary, so that the wave packet can be made narrow enough to satisfy the conditions of the quasi-classical regime. This is it for today, but I want to leave you with this very important result. The quasi-classical limit applies to most macroscopic objects, providing a clear connection between the quantum microscopic world and the classical macroscopic world. Ehrenfest's theorem provides a means to relay the classical and the quantum worlds. However, the time evolution of expectation values goes well beyond this. To see another application, I encourage you to check out the video on constants of motion. And as always, if you like the video, please subscribe.